Northumberland has long been called the Secret Kingdom, and when you visit the coast, you will see the crown jewels. This magnificent 39-mile stretch of coastline was designated as an area of outstanding natural beauty in 1939, and it's easy to see why. In 635 AD, the young Prince Oswald, heir to the throne of Northumbria, returned from exile on Iona to regain his kingdom from King Penda of Mercia. On gaining victory over the pagan Mercians, Oswald swore that he would convert his people to Christianity, and he brought the missionary monk Aidan to build the first Christian monastery in Northumbria, on Lindisfarne. The island's economy now depends heavily on tourism, but the upturned hulls of old herring boats provide a reminder of a once thriving fishing industry, and they still provide a use today as store sheds. Although it was totally destroyed by the Vikings in 793, it was a group of Benedictine monks from Durham who in 1083 returned to build a new priory dedicated to St Cuthbert and they renamed it Holy Island. Lindisfarne Castle was built as an artillery fort in the 1530s by Henry VIII, but it saw little in the way of action. It was restored as a residence in the 1880s by Sir Edwin Lutyens and handed over to the National Trust in 1944. Isn't this fantastic? I'm at Heatherslaw Mill and it's just outside the little village of Etel, at Forden Etel, at the top of Northumberland. Now, there's been a water mill here since the 12th century. This building, however, was put up around about the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And the unusual thing about this mill is that the water wheel is inside. From Heatherslaw, the village of Eatle is just a short train ride away on the narrow gauge steam railway. Eatle is the only village in Northumberland with thatched cottages and a 14th century castle. Well, 
Welcome to Bamburgh, a beautiful village that's the jewel in the crown of the Northumbrian coast. Bamburgh's famous for two things. The 12th century castle, just up there, which is probably one of the most photographed castles in the country, and Grace Darling, and her grave is just up here. She was the heroine of the lifeboat rescues in the Victorian era. Grace was born in 1815, just up the street from the museum. When she was just a young girl in her twenties, Grace and her father braved a violent storm one night. There were horrendous seas, and they went out not once but several times in a tiny little rowing boat to rescue the crew and passengers of the forefarsher that had found it on the rocks. Bambra Castle has been recently restored, first by Lord Crewe in the 1750s and more recently by the first Lord Armstrong at the end of the 19th century. And it now houses the Armstrong Museum and Bambra Castle Aviation Artifacts Museum. A bit of a mouthful, but it's well worth looking at. History is not the only claim to fame that Bambra has. There are absolutely miles of wonderful sandy beaches for those who like to walk, or you can just sit back and watch the world go by and the relatively quiet roads make cycling an absolute pleasure. If you're keen on bird watching, then you've got to go over to the Farne Islands. And also at nearby Budel Bay, you'll often see some rarities. Sea Houses and its fishing harbour is the most convenient place to take a trip out to the Farne Island Nature Reserve. It's a cluster of 28 islands that have become a sanctuary for a large colony of grey seals and many thousands of seabirds. And the most essential piece of clothing for a visit here is a hat. Beadnell Bay is the only harbour on England's east coast that faces west. Beadnell is one of the most popular places for water sports. The offshore reefs attract divers and the wide curves of the bay and the prevailing winds make it ideal for wind and kite surfers. Children have a great time here as there's loads of space for them to let off steam in a safe and secure environment. And you're literally only yards from the National Trust protected sand dunes and the glorious sandy beach of Beadnell Bay, where you can walk the dog, build sandcastles and generally chill out. The jagged ruins of Dunstanborough Castle sit on a cliff top just a mile and a half from Craster. Built in 1315 by the Earl of Leicester, the castle was a defence against the marauding Scots. The cosy little harbour at Craster was built in 1906 by the Craster family and it's extremely popular with fishermen who enjoy a good day out on one of the boats or just while away the time fishing from the harbour. But Craster is far more famous for the kippers that are still cured here using traditional methods.
A little way inland, at the ancient town of Annick, is by far one of the most magnificent castles in Great Britain. Annick Castle is the second largest inhabited castle in England, the first being Windsor Castle. In fact, it was described by the Victorians as the Windsor of the North. And the castle is the home of the Duke of Northumberland, whose family, the Percys, have lived here since 1309. This border stronghold has survived quite a few battles in its time, but now it peacefully dominates the picturesque market town of Annick, and it overlooks landscapes designed by Capability Brown. The stern medieval exterior really hides a wonderful house within. It's furnished in Italian Renaissance style, with paintings by Titian, Van Dyck and Canaletto, with fine furniture and an exquisite collection of china. Just a short stroll down the road from Annick Castle is the now world-famous Annick Garden. This was the vision of the Duchess of Northumberland. She wanted to create a beautiful public space that was accessible to everyone. A garden which is a place of contemplation, a place of fun, a place of inspiration and education. And it truly caters for everyone, from the young to the old. In fact, there's even a massive disabled car park right on the doorstep by the entrance. Follow the River Alm to the sea at Almouth and you're in for a treat. In the Middle Ages this was a thriving grain port, but over the centuries the main harbour silted up, leaving one of the most beautiful little estuaries to be found anywhere in the country. Wide golden sands, clear water and skies that seem to go on forever. A little further south and the River Coquette meets the sea at Amble Harbour and passes through Warkworth where another castle stands guard over the coast and the pretty little village that still retains its medieval layout. At Blythe, this is where the old gives way to the new. Blythe is Northumberland's largest town, which grew as the major seaport for the export of Northumberland coal. Today, the port's main trade is aluminium ore, paper pulp and timber from Scandinavia. The nine eye-catching wind turbines make a striking landmark, as well as contributing renewable energy to the national grid. The journey down the Northumberland coast ends at the mouth of the mighty River Tyne. It's not just a journey through a beautiful landscape, it's a journey through time. Enjoy it.